So every single week I get asked at least a couple thousand questions, whether it's on a comment or a DM or an email. And to be honest with you guys, it's extremely difficult to answer everybody's question. You're only one person. You can't answer everybody's question, even though you want to. So a lot of you guys have suggested, Willie, why don't you do a Q&A video series? And I thought that's a really dope, dope idea. I can get you guys involved. I could answer one person's question that maybe 50 other people have, and they could all hear the answer at the same time. So I think it's going to be a lot of fun. I think it's going to be really helpful for you. But we have a lot of questions from the Trip Team family, so let's jump into it. Tripping no acid in the hotel lobby. Everything moving hella fast, Ricky Bobby. Floating in the ethers. Listen to the ethers, you can probably tell the future. Superhuman man. What's going on trip team? First of all, if you're new to this channel, I want to welcome you guys. Make sure you hit that subscribe button, follow me on social media, and drop a comment down below if you guys have a question that you want featured on an upcoming Q&A. Now, my name's Willie Michael. Most of you guys already know me, but if you don't know me, I'm a mycologist. I'm a psychonaut. I lived that psychedelic lifestyle, had a really big YouTube channel. Me and YouTube had a different vision on things. But I decided to open up a YouTube friendly YouTube channel that's surrounded around the same content, but we're going to keep it safe. If you guys want all my new and past texts and extractions and stuff like that, just go into the description. You guys could get the link to my website. You guys could get the link to my Patreon. You guys could get the link to my Vimeo. That's where we drop all that. But on this YouTube, we're going to be doing other things, but not text. We can't show text on here that go against YouTube's guidelines. We just can't do it if we want to keep this YouTube channel going. And you know, YouTube's a great platform and I want to utilize it to give you guys other types of information. And at the same time, you guys could get all my other stuff through any of them other platforms. There's new videos released every single week. So make sure you guys go check all that out. With that said, a bunch of Trip Team family members were like, Willie, you should do something where people could ask questions, we could get involved, and everybody could hear the answers to the questions because it would really help us out. So I decided why not do a Q&A right here on my YouTube channel every single week. So if you guys have a question, just go follow me on social media or drop your question down below in the comments. Every week on social media, I'm going to write a post pretty much asking you guys if you have any questions. And then at the end of the week, before we film the video, I'm going to go through, select however many questions we can, and I'm going to answer them for you guys right here. So with all that said, let's jump right into this because there's a lot of questions to answer and I want to try to get to as many as possible. So our first question comes from Instagram from a user by the name of at Push for Life. So... Push for Life says, Willie Michael, first off, thanks for all the inspiration and knowledge you give, brother. The whole Trip Team fam and myself have much gratitude. No, thank you. I appreciate all you guys. I'm honored, and it's a blessing to do what I do. I, I absolutely love it, and I wouldn't want to do anything else. My question is on sub. I'm currently mixing up horse poo. I don't have straight cow manure using a stair compost. Coco Core and Verm. The results were not bad, but I felt like there was way too many aborts. Is it better to do just Coco and Verm? Thanks for your time, brother. Namaste. Okay, so this is a good question. First, let me take off these glasses because they keep getting fogged up. So when it comes to substrates, especially nutrients like horse poo or cow poo, it really doesn't matter. Them two things are very close and one really isn't better than the other. Most people actually prefer horse poo over cow poo, but I've used both and you can get great results from both. Aborts are usually more or less environmental issues. So if you don't have the correct amount of FAE, if there's too high of CO2 levels when the mushrooms are fruiting, this could cause aborts. Heavy misting can cause aborts. Um, temperature changes can cause aborts. It's more environmental. It also has to do with genetics too. But if you're getting the same result, a lot of aborts with different syringes from different substrains, and you're still getting a massive amount 
of abort, then it's probably an environmental issue. Now, when I say environmental, I mean the internal environment within your fruiting chamber. Whether you're using a monotub, a shotgun fruiting chamber, it really doesn't matter. You really have to pay close attention to them RH numbers. You really have to pay attention to them temperatures and you have to make sure you're misting and fanning correctly. I know this might sound ridiculous, but misting and fanning actually plays a big part in pin set and triggering pinning. So it's very important that you guys know that you're misting and fanning correctly. Your temperatures are correct. Your RH is at the correct percentage. So when it comes to fruiting, aborts are going to happen regardless. You're never going to get a flush where you get no aborts. There's always going to be aborts. It, it's just going to happen. What I suggest you try doing is try fruiting in a different way. So if you've only been using trays inside of a Martha or you've only been using a monotub or you've only been using a shotgun fruiting chamber, try switching it up. Try using a different form of fruiting. So just choose one of the later and try using that and see if that makes a difference. I really don't think cow manure over horse manure is going to make any difference for you. It really comes down to environment. So what I would try doing is try using a different form of fruiting. If that doesn't work for you, then it might be a genetics issue if you're using the same substrain. So if you're using the same exact spores for all these grows, it might just have a really weak genetic pool. So it really depends. If you're using multiple different syringes, multiple different substrains from multiple different vendors or different people, then it's definitely an environmental thing. You wanna make sure you're misting and fanning at least three times a day. You do your light misting and then you fan for 60 plus seconds. You wanna make sure you're paying attention to all them numbers. So your temperature, your RH, you want your 12-12, your fanning and misting, and everything should be good. Like I said, you're always going to get aborts, but you shouldn't be having massive numbers of aborts. If they're aborting, then something is wrong, and it's usually an environmental thing. So hopefully this answered your question. If you have any other questions or if you want to give more details, you know, exactly what you're growing, if it's from the same syringe, what type of fruiting you're doing, you know, there's a lot of other details that would help me narrow things down a little bit better. But as just uh, overall from the question you asked, I'd say focus more on the environment than the substrate itself and making sure that all them numbers are on point. And if the same thing is happening, then we can move on to the next thing. But 99% of the time, when you get a massive amount of aborts, it's an environmental thing. So our next question comes from at Fanasmart23 and he asks, Willie, how do you deal with the fear of being caught? And this is a really complex question, but pretty much there's no fear. I'm not scared of being caught. You know, um, I'm sharing information. Mycology is a legitimate science. It's not illegal to be a mycologist. Actually, it's a great privilege to be a mycologist. The psychedelic lifestyle is a subculture. It's a way of living. It's a way of life. And it's the only way I want to live. I love what I do. I love helping you guys. Every week, at least one or two messages come through from various different sources. People telling me their, their story and how I saved their life, literally. And just one of those messages makes everything worth it. And if they wanted to come and arrest me for putting out informational videos, so be it. Uh, I'm ready for the fight. You know what I'm saying? I already got lawyers on standby. And it would just shed more light on what we're doing. And especially in this day and age where things are starting to become normalized, where we're starting to legalize psilocybin and, you know, cannabis is pretty much legal everywhere. I'm not worried about it. You know, the things that we use for our spiritual and beliefs and our well-being have been used way before there was any structure of law. So for them to come and tell us we're wrong for our belief system or sharing information, that's absolutely insane. I mean, you wanna come into my house, there's nothing in my house that's gonna be considered illegal. 
you know, the videos I show are completely educational. And there's nothing on my person or within any of my properties that would violate any law. So if they wanted to come and take me away for sharing information with you guys, so be it. Let it happen. I actually welcome it. And it's it wouldn't be a bad thing for me. Like I said, it would just shine a bigger light on what we're doing. My thing is harm reduction. And I want to make sure you guys are spiritually and physically well. So this is very important information. And there's nothing wrong with sharing that information. Can it happen? Of course it could happen. Am I worried or fearful? Absolutely not. Like I said, I, I'm not... And it wouldn't stop me from doing what I'm doing. We actually have procedures in place if something like that ever happened. So if something like that ever happened, the show would continue. And you guys would hear from somebody. We have tons of videos, backlogs. So, and then you guys could watch it on the media. So it would be a lot of fun. So the next question is from Arvin47. And he asks, Willie... What is your preferred monotub size and how many quart jars of spawn do you use for each one? It really depends. I use different size monotubs for different things. So if I'm working genetics, I use mini monotubs because I can do multiple isolated grows in a relatively small area and see how each one fruits out. Now, if I'm going for yield, I'm going to use something like the Mega Monotub. So that's going to be anything above a 60 quart monotub. I like to go for 100 quarts or bigger if I'm going to do a Mega Mono. If I was trying to fruit out a decent yield from multiple different types of substrains, then I would use 60 quart monotubs. And that way I could stack them up side by side or however I want to do it. And I could do that in a relatively small space as well. So it really just comes down to that. It depends on why I'm actually fruiting that out. Am I fruiting it out because of genetics? Am I fruiting it out for yield? It really just depends. Now, when it comes to the spawn sub ratio, very, very simple. Always try to keep a one to one ratio. So you always want to try to keep one quart of colonized spawn to one quart of pasteurized substrate or one pound to one pound, two pounds to two pounds. You just want to keep a one to one ratio. Now you could stretch it to a two to one ratio. So you could do two parts pasteurized substrate to one part colonized spawn, but it's on a colonize slower, but you'll be perfectly fine. I never suggest going any bigger than that. So that's the reason why we always try to keep a one to one ratio at the most two to one, but you never really want to go beyond that because all it's going to do is just slow down the colonization process, which is going to allow adequate time for anything in the general environment to set in and start eating up them nutrients. So the same way our mycelium eats up them nutrients like the cow poo and the gypsum and whatever else we might have in our substrate, bacterias and molds like them same exact things. They like them same exact temperatures. So it's pretty much a battle. It's can the mycelium colonize that substrate before anything else. So that way we could get the mycelium to give us some fruits. That's pretty much all it comes down to. So when it comes to ratio, it's that simple, no matter what you're growing. And the monotub, it just really depends on what I'm trying to do, what I'm trying to get out of it. What's my purpose for doing it. That's going to dictate whether I use a bigger or smaller monotub. Pretty much that's it. All right, so let's try to get into one or two more questions before we go. So our next question comes from Charles Desert Sparrow. He said, super jazzed about you doing some more vids. Can't wait. Thank you, brother. I'm excited about pushing out new content too. And thank you for your support. Question is, what's the best grain for doing sclerotia, rye, or corn? And will you do a video on hybridizing races? So let's answer the first part of that question. What's the best grain for sclerotia? So if rye and corn are your only options, you can't get anything else, then rye. Rye works really, really good. I always like to use smaller grains for sclerotia. So my preferred grain for sclerotia would either be Milo 
or it would be ryegrass seed. Ryegrass seed is the most common. It's very cheap. You can get a 50 pound bag of ryegrass seed from shrimpsupply.com for extremely cheap. And if you can't get ryegrass seed, then I would say rye, rye berries. Rye berries are the next best thing or milo. Wild bird seed works great because it's mostly milo and wild bird seed. Corn will still work, but it's not as good. So I suggest using corn as the last grain. All the way down at the end, if you can't get anything else, then corn will work. So the second part of your question, even though it might sound like a simple question, can you show us how to create hybrids or how is a hybrid created? It sounds like a simple question, but it isn't. It's extremely complicated and it requires an extremely detailed and complicated answer which will just go over a lot of people's head, but I'll try to explain it as efficiently as possible and as easy as possible so you guys can understand how it works. Now, a couple people asked the same exact question. Um, one of the questions I was actually gonna answer right after your question, I didn't even realize you asked this question, but at Captain Colin J asked a very similar question and I was gonna answer it right after your question, but since you asked it, We'll just kill two birds with one stone and I'll answer it right now. So to create a hybrid. So when it comes to cannabis, you have two plants, a male and a female. The male pollinates the female. It doesn't matter if it's an indica or a sativa. It pollinates the female. The female creates seeds. Bingo, bingo. We have a hybrid, right? Now, of course, you could go into phenol selection and you know, stuff like that, it gets more complicated. It's not just as easy as that to create a hybrid, but the gist of it is the male pollinates the female, the female creates seeds, and the seeds are a hybrid. With mushrooms, they're completely different from plants. They're, they're not even in the same ballpark. So all mushrooms have what's called spores, right? We, we look at spores like that's the seeds of the mushroom. Well, them spores on a microscopic level have what's called monocarions. Monocarions are a single nucleus cell. And what you would want to do is get the Penelia sciences and the Psilocybe sciences at the monocarion level to mate, creating a mycelial network that would in turn create fruits and then fruits would drop spores. You would have your hybrid. But this is done in gourmet mushrooms all the time because gourmet mushrooms are a big market and they, you know, these companies that sell mushrooms produce millions if not billions of dollars and they put the money into creating bigger shiitake or, you know, these two mushroom hybrids to make a better mushroom. But when it comes to psychedelic or active mushrooms, the money in the science isn't invested into them types of mushrooms yet. And the reason why I say yet is because now with legalization, companies are gonna back it up and start putting more money creating hybrids. Watch, you'll see, that's exactly what's gonna happen. But it's a very difficult process. So that's one way of doing it. The second way of accomplishing this is called anastomosis. Now, Anastomosis happens all the time when we use a multi-spore syringe or a multi-spore print at a high frequency. So pretty much there's a bunch of different genetics in there. One set of genetics will be the dominant ones and they'll fuse together with lesser dominant mating spores and they'll create this mycelial network. This is much more common within substrains. So it's not going to be the same if we took Penelia sciences spores, Psilocybe cubensis spores, put them in a syringe together, shook them up, inoculated, and hoped and prayed that anastomosis would happen and the cubensis spores would fuse or mate with the Penelia spores. This happens more with substrains. So when we take, just for instance, Golden Teacher, we take a multi-spore print, we make a syringe, there's millions, if not billions of genetics inside that single spore syringe. And any number of them could germinate. So it only takes two spores to germinate 
to stop the growth process. Now, when we do that, it's not that the two spores have the same genetics. That's why they're fusing together. No, anastomosis is happening. So it's fusing together with the other spore to create a mycelial network. It, it's mating with that other spore. And this happens, like I said, with substrains, but not so much species to species. I'm trying to explain it the easiest way I can. It, it could get really complicated and this could be a whole episode in itself. But pretty much, let's say we got the Penelia sciences and the Cubensis to mate and it created mycelium. The mycelium gave us fruits. We still didn't create a hybrid. It's only a success if that hybrid drops spores. We needed to drop spores in order for it to be a success. Like I said, they do this with gourmet mushrooms, but on the active mushroom side, it really hasn't been done yet. You know, there's albino penis envy, which they say was created. It's a hybrid, right? Uh, I forget exactly what it's a hybrid of. I think it's a hybrid of, they said, penis envy and albino A plus or something like that. I don't believe it. So we have in mycology, when we grow mushrooms, we have what's called mutations. So sometimes you'll see rust colored spores. Sometimes you'll see mushrooms that drop clear spores like albino penis envy. Sometimes we'll get albinos, right? And it's not that it's a hybrid, it's just a mutation. And if you could isolate that mutation, you could keep replicating them fruits like with albino penis envy. In order for uh, albino to be considered a true albino, it has to lack all pigmentation. So its spores have to be clear. So albino penis envy has clear spores. If you look at it under a scope, they're clear. It drops clear spores. Now things like albino A+, even though it looks like an albino, it's not a real albino because it still drops black purple spores. So what happened was somebody grew the mushrooms. One of their mushrooms came out all white and lacked any color on the tissue of the mushroom. And they were able to replicate that by isolation. We see this over and over. We see it with RDU, which is the rust colored Penelia sciences from Australia. But in order to create a true hybrid, it has to be done at that level. There's a lot more that goes into it. That's just really brief layman's explanation. It's a lot deeper than that. And if you guys want a video of me going into depth on hybridization and how it works, and we could look at images of spores and I could explain to you guys what's going on and what has to take place, I would be more than happy to do that with you. Now, some people say, well, can I take mycelium from one and mycelium from the other, put them on agar and let them grow together and fuse together on agar and that will, it will never fuse together. So if you put one strain of mushrooms and another substrain of mushrooms and you take a tissue sample and put it on each end of a petri dish, let it grow together, it will separate where it meets. There'll be a division in between the two. It won't fuse together. That's how we know if we have a monoculture. After we've isolated and isolated and transferred and isolated, we end up taking a sample from each end, placing it on agar, letting it to grow together. And if it fuses together, we have a monoculture, which is an isolated strain of genetics. And that's how we do it. We know we don't have a monoculture if we do that and it separates because it won't fuse together if it doesn't share the same genetics. So things have to be done on a monocarion level or anastomosis level in order for us to get a hybrid. Like I said, anastomosis happens all the time when we use multi-spore syringes and multi-spore prints because it's done at a high frequency, but it's within the same substrain. So it's a lot easier for that to take place versus two separate types of fungi like Penelia sciences and cubensis. Now, will it happen someday? I'm sure it will happen someday, especially now that they're focusing more efforts on active mushrooms, but we're gonna have to see where things go. Like I said, if you guys want a video on it, I'd be happy to do that. Now, I know this took up a lot of time me explaining that, 
but it required that type of explanation. It could even go deeper than that. I mean, this could have been a two, three hour explanation, but I tried to sum it up and make it as easy as possible for you guys so you can understand how it works. Now, there is a lot of phony baloney, fugazi, fake people out there that are claiming they have syringes of penis envy and koi or this and that. It's a gimmick, guys. These are scam companies that are trying to sell you syringes and hype up a market that doesn't exist. Don't fall for it because there's a lot of scammers out there that are preying on people. Like I said, we got some. So what they're calling it is cape. So it's koi and albino penis envy, supposedly hybrid. We got some. We have them colonizing. I actually got Smoke Ken from Paranormal Hood. He's actually colonizing some. We're going to see what they turn out to be. And I'm going to share that with you guys right here on my YouTube channel. Like I said, if this video was informative or it helped you out, make sure you hit that subscribe button. You hit that like button. And if you have any questions, drop them down below. Or you guys could go follow me on social media and you guys could drop your question when I ask it. So every week I'm going to put a post up. Do you guys have any questions for the upcoming Q&A? We're going to select some questions. We're going to answer them just like this. You guys have great questions. I'm always amazed at the questions you guys ask. They're not simple questions. You know, you guys really go in depth and I appreciate it. And I love answering the questions that you guys have. This is a lot of fun for me. So make sure you guys stay tuned. Make sure you hit that subscribe, like, comment, all that good stuff. I love you guys. Thank you for all your love and support. Do good, be good, live good. Namaste.